So I think I understand that we have a link with Jake Applebaum. Jake is a tour developer, the WikiLeaks spokesperson in the United States of America. Hey, there you are. Hello, Jake. We're just introducing you. <laughs> uh, hi, it's um, really quite an honor to be invited to this symposium. And I want to thank Gavin and Sarah and everyone who made this possible. Um, especially um, the people at the Wild Island Foundation that gave us space to be able to have, to have this conversation. Um, as some of you know, I'm, I'm not actually able to, uh, to come to London for the same reasons as Laura, uh, due to my reporting relating to things with WikiLeaks as well as uh, dealing with uh, various topics me, uh, reporting on Snowden-related issues. Excuse me, Jake. So, one, one moment. Um, Sound is not good. Can I've been me? asked today to come to talk with you about anonymity, and um, I had a lot of commentary about a lot of the things that I've Can seen in the him? symposium. Can you tell him that um, you and so I guess we could start uh, by saying, in the context of operational security, um, it's really important not to try to engage in spycraft with spies, I think. Uh, it's basically a losing game. Um, but if you do have an interest in this, this seems to be a common topic. There's a really um, um, fantastic book by a guy named Victor Sergei, and it's called What Every Radical Should Know. And you can find a PDF of it online. And he talks a lot about spy tradecraft of this kind, but it's for essentially for revolutionaries. It's a, it's a book that discusses um, the uh, Ocarina and as well as the Cheka uh, in terms of looking at the archives of their documents uh, after the Russian Revolution. And um, it talks about everything in terms of this spy tradecraft, but also it talks about it from the perspective of resistance of a particular um, set of people who are trying to undermine, let's say, an attempt at social change. And the reason I mention that is that I think that it's important to consider that basically every effective journalist is an activist. Um, and by that, what I mean is that you're an activist for the truth. Uh, this is something that a, a German journalist, Thilo Jung, has said. He says, alle Journalisten sind Aktivisten für die Wahrheit, which is all journalists are activists for the truth. And I feel very strongly about this because anything else is advertising and propaganda. And I think it's, it's extremely important then to realize that there's an adversarial role and to think about it. Uh, that book does a good job, I think, of laying it out from a historical perspective, and there are a lot of parallels. It discusses things like social graphing, it discusses the necessity to not trust telephones. Um, and so you can learn, of course, about how to try to obfuscate uh, about telephones, but um, frankly, I just think probably you will fail. Um, you may succeed to some extent, um, but only for a time, and maybe not when someone looks at historical data with different information. Intelligence gathering in particular is very scary when it comes to anonymity because these people, especially with programs like Tempora, seek to create um, a kind of data, va uh, data valence that will last for as long as it's possible. You know, the U United States says with the NSA that they have data retention, which is for approximately 15 years, but since we have not yet reached the end of that 15-year cycle, um, I actually find that uh, a hard-to-believe limit. Um, and in any case, most people only talk about the collection phase. They don't really talk about the synthesis and analysis phase. And I think when we discuss um, anonymity, we have to consider that on a long time frame, the synthesis and analysis frame of reference will come to bite you in the ass. Um, so this notion of buying prepaid cell phones, um, it's really just uh, a nice uh, band-aid. But the, the fundamental issue is that cell phones are tracking devices that make phone calls, or in some cases, for example, if you're in Pakistan, they are just simply drone magnets. Uh, they will get you killed. The metadata associated with the actual cell phone, that is your MC or your IMEI, that's the identifier in the SIM card or the hardware identifier on the phone, um, it's simply the case that that data will be cross-correlated with everyone that's called. A social graph will be built. They'll do contact chaining. From that, they will look up locations of people. From that, they will determine an optimal way to do what is called TVID, technical voice identification. They do that in real time for certain countries. Um, for example, we know uh, WikiLeaks talked about country X. Uh, country X is a country in which they do that and they do drone strikes from what I can tell. And they do that with cell phones. So if you use, for example, a prepaid cell phone and you make a phone call and you say something, 
You will speak into a phone. A machine will automatically determine that it is you, Daniel Ellsberg, in the second row there that is speaking. They will tie your identity then to that phone, and they will use that as a tracking device. And when they do a drone strike on you, if you happen to be in Wazaristan, for example, then they will simply kill you. Now, this is a really interesting weapon uh, in that if you happen to use someone else's phone quite regularly and leave it on them, uh, maybe you could get them killed instead. Not that I'm recommending it, but it's an interesting point. Um, they do a thing that's called PIDROV as well as TVID, uh, which is to say that they try to do uh, actual identification. They want to look at full motion video surveillance. And so this notion of like changing out all the identifiers, but still leaving the content unencrypted is quite frankly just a bunch of hokey bullshit. Spycraft it does not work. Do not do that. Cell phones are compromised. They were designed in order to give the state an advantage. And in fact, they were designed by the telephone companies to ensure that they would have access to your content so that they could use you as a negotiating uh, point when someone wants other things from them. For example, they're willing to give up data on you, but they want to re retain control of their network otherwise. Those are compromises they make, and you are, in fact, the thing that they give up. Um, the rest of the internet is not so different than that. So everything you have, every computer you have, um, there are unique identifiers, and those unique identifiers are, of course, tied to you. Um, as you browse the web, as you search things, they build, that is, Tempora, uh, the NSA, GCHQ related programs, X key score. These programs build profiles for a thing that's called persona session collection. And if you happen to be tasked, for example, with your Chancellor Merkel, um, what happens is that all the things that are associated with you, those things, they create automatic what are, what are called soft selections and hard selections. And those soft and hard selectors essentially pull out data and associated data and get stored in what's called a corporate repository. That's just a fancy way of NSA spy saying they steal your data and they put it in a database. So when we think about anonymity, it's not just about using Tor, though I think it's a good idea to use a system like Tails, which integrates Tor and everything you do is going over Tor. Uh, it's an important thing to also consider the hardware you use. Laura mentioned, for example, yesterday, um, that you know she had this this laptop. We actually bought that in New York City. A great example about anonymity is that when we went and bought that laptop, um, I'm absolutely certain we were physically surveilled and followed. Um, the fact of the matter, though, is that the software, of course, helps to change some of the unique identifiers. Keeping it in your possession ensures that someone doesn't tamper with it. Using something like Tails helps. But then if you use that simply to connect to a service which has all of your true name information, uh, there's a good chance that someone will target you with an exploit, um, potentially by co-opting the provider, in fact, to do exactly that, um, which I think does happen quite often. Um, there's, of course, a lot of other things um, that we could talk about in terms of operational security. Uh, using something like the upcoming operating system subgraph that David Mirza will talk about, I think um, we're starting to understand how to build adversary-resistant computing. But fundamentally, there is a human change that needs to take place. Um, so for example, when Ross Anderson said, um, use Skype, you'll blend in. Um, I can't speak strongly against this um, without saying that I think that we'll learn a lot more about this in the future. So there's a caveat here, which is that based on what people know uh, at present, they think that using Skype will help you blend in. Um, I don't actually think that that's true. Um, I think that, in fact, Skype has very good surveillance. Uh, they are a prison partner. Uh, the crypto that is there might help you against someone in a cafe that has limited uh, capabilities, but it most certainly will not help you against an adversary like GCHQ uh, or the NSA. I think that those guys, uh, they've got Skype dialed in pretty good, and uh, they, they basically can surveil people on command with that. There are some caveats to it. It's not 100% perfect, but the selector-based surveillance does work. So when you type things, when you send files, that stuff is grabbed. Um, to give you another idea, if you think that just sending a document from an anonymous email account will uh, be safe, X Keyscore actually maintains the capability of searching through, for example, Microsoft Word documents to find specific images. That is, you have a letterhead of a, let's say, um, a known uh, organization of some kind, and they happen to use the same letterhead in every single one of their documents. You can automatically extract those documents without knowing anything else at all, simply by looking through all the documents on the internet to find the selection term, which is their logo, 
And then everything that's related to that gets stored and tagged, and then it shows up on an analyst's desk in real time. So the answer to that is end-to-end -end cryptography, and of course, something like an anonymity system, something like Tor. Um, but even then, you still have to take precautions in the rest of your life. Doing things from your own home is probably not the safest thing that you can imagine. It's probably, in fact, a very bad idea. Unless you're sending all your traffic over Tor, it's an extremely dangerous thing because every time you update software, every time you browse a web, even when you do an innocuous thing like just watching a cat video on YouTube, that will open up as a vector, a way to compromise the computer systems that are in your house that are nearby you. Um, and even having an air gap is not necessarily going to help with that, um, though it might in some cases. Um, so um, I really, I guess, to drive it home, when you use proprietary software like this absolute fucking garbage Skype software, we're not using that now, by the way, um, but it, just to be clear about that, when you use things like Skype, when you use things like a mobile phone, you are using tools that are collaborating with not only the surveillance state, but helping to build a surveillance society. So it's almost impossible to use them safely. And if we keep this in mind, that doesn't mean that you should never use them because sometimes getting the signal out is more important. But do not believe the fallacy that there's simply too much data that you will escape the synthesis and analysis phase. That just will not happen. Um, and that is a little bit depressing, and I realize that it's not a happy time, but there are things that are alternatives, things like Jitsi, um, which provide end-to-end -end encrypted ways of communicating. There are things like GNU PG, which are infinitely unusable, but actually secure. Um, from my research into cryptography, the off the record messaging protocol, as well as strong EGP keys, that is large RSA keys, uh, larger than 2048 bit, so something like a 4096 bit RSA key, uh, appear to be safe from passive surveillance. That useful, but it is important also to consider um, sort of realms of compromise. If you're using OTR and someone breaks into your computer, they will not be able to decrypt the past conversations that you've had. It's a property called forward secrecy. That can help you. And what does that have to do with anonymity? When you evaluate privacy systems, for example, something like a VPN, you want this property. You want forward secrecy. You want another property. It's called free software. And that provides you with the four freedoms. That would include the freedom to study the software, to modify the software, to share the modification with your neighbors, and to run the program for any purpose whatsoever. Those four freedoms are essential for your friends, your technical friends, and for yourselves to really be able to evaluate the system that you're using, or at least to begin with that evaluation. So, of course, there's a lot more than that that is necessary. But if we start with those things, we, we change the balance where selector-based dragnet surveillance is extremely effective, and we move it from eavesdropping into active attacks. And we want to change it from a passive attack that is just monitoring into an active attack. Because with cryptography, an active attack allows you, for example, to detect that this is happening. Um, now, you may be anonymous to the network, but you may not be anonymous to the person you're speaking to. You may use a pseudonym, you may use a system like Pond, which doesn't have names at all, but rather just uses cryptographic keys. And if you use a system like that, you, of course, want to make sure that a passive attack becomes an active attack, and an active attack is sometimes not possible without a burglary. And we, we in the tech world, often jokingly call this, we want Eve to become Mallory, and we want Mallory to become burglary. It sounds a little bit... Uh, I would say convoluted to talk about it in those terms, but you want to do that because it allows you to then do things like set up a hidden camera in your house. So when the burglary takes place, you've got photographs of those people. You turn the table, you change the economic game by doing that. So strong cryptography, strong anonymity using, for example, something like a crypto phone, which I think the new version of it, if you're going to use a cell phone, something like the crypto phone, which has the ability to change unique identifiers which has the ability to use IP instead of the telephone network to make end-to-end -end calls, to use signal, to use red phone. There are degrees and there's a continuum of the amount of, let's say, anonymity or privacy you might be able to have. Crypto phone, for example, works over Tor, red phone doesn't. Uh, something like Silent Circle doesn't work over Tor and it's not free software and you have to pay them. So there are, of course, different degrees relating to this. Um, and we have to sort of decide what the threat model is. If you want to remain anonymous with a particular source, you have to put a lot of effort in right now, precisely because the entire world is geared towards not allowing you to do that. 
It's basically guaranteeing that if you just do things with the least amount of effort, um, everything about you and your devices will become known to a passive adversary. Um, now, there are lots of uh, operational security related things that we could talk about. And I don't think that we actually have enough time to talk about it today. But I want to I want to propose a very simple way to think about anonymity because I think it's a very confusing topic. And I think that often people uh, essentially um, don't pay attention to these things or they think if it's not perfect, it's not good enough. Um, so I want to talk about it in terms of seeing networks. So where you are right now in the symposium, I see, you know, for example, burned in the front row. Um, if he was using a computer, um, and he was monitoring, let's say, the person to his left who is leaning on uh, his chin right now, um, that guy right there, exactly, um, or perhaps the subgraph guys a couple rows back. Um, if, for example, they were watching the network, they would see it local to you. So, for example, using a virtual private network, if it was actually secure, most of them aren't, but if it was actually secure, they would see someone connecting to a virtual private network. Now, if you happen to work for, let's say, The Guardian, and you connect to The Guardian's VPN, which is probably not secure because they take security about as seriously as they take source protection seriously. Um, if you were to, for example, uh, use that VPN, you know they're a Guardian person. They don't have local anonymity. And what that means is that you now know out of the entire set of people that you can start to target them and to attack them. They don't have anonymity for their very small set. That's for an adversary which is merely burned. Now, burned is a badass computer hacker, so that's not to disparage him. But it is to say that if he can do it, you can bet your ass any government agency has tools that they have purchased that can do it too. So in that case, you want to think about it in terms of the local network being very unfriendly to you. Uh, if you are using your home network, that's especially the case. Probably it is the case that even if you have everything on a Tails laptop set up, you are ready to go, everything runs over Tor. If you are, for example, Cy Hirsch, or you are Daniel Ellsberg, or you're Laura Poitras, you probably have a microphone in your house. That would be my guess. Or you have another computer which can be turned into a microphone, or you have a phone that can be turned into a microphone. So you also have to think not only about the computer you use and the networks you use, but the things and the objects around it that are part of the information society, essentially, that can be used to betray the efforts you put in. Um, I think that that is, of course, a very straightforward thing to say, but it's a hard thing to really integrate. Um, next up, when you, for example, use this anonymity network or you use a VPN, you want to make sure that the information you have is compartmented. So the first part of the network sees you're coming from the CIJ uh, Unity uh, forum right now, and then, of course, the second part of the network, the second hop in the Tor network, sees you're coming from another Tor node, the third hop at the exit node, um, that will, of course, see you're going to do something else. In my case, yesterday I was just watching the live stream and I was doing it from somewhere in Germany. Now, that, of course, meant that the people that are running the live stream knew someone on Tor was watching it, but they didn't know who or what. That's very useful also because a web browser is a very vulnerable piece of software and targeting someone is a very useful thing to, do to break into their computer. So when you have this kind of anonymity, this location anonymity, or uh, a lack of unique identifiers when you do a thing on the web or when you chat with a person, for example, um, that really changes the game about the security of the, of the system, but it also changes the way that someone might try to violate the assumptions that you have. Now, if you use a virtual private network, all of those little compartmental, uh, compartmentalized things, they actually all are in one place, which is to say they're not compartmented very well, if at all. So using a virtual private network instead of using a thing like Tor or another peer-to-peer -peer anonymity network with diverse users and diverse resources, um, to me, it's extremely uh, important to consider that you're basically just hoping that they won't screw you over. And hope is not a strategy for survival. It's a strategy, in fact, almost certainly for annihilation. So using a virtual private network, for example, is a very bad idea in a lot of cases if what you want is anonymity. Um, now, I won't believe the point uh, much further about, about things like that, but if you think about it in terms of what you're trying to protect, you also have to think about it in terms of how long you want to protect it. Cryptography will help you, but 100 years from now, a lot of the cryptography that we use probably will not survive if, for example, there is ever a slight mathematical bug. Even if the theory is correct, the practice might not be. Um, if, for example, you use a system like PGP, you only need the key to be disclosed once. Now, again, from what I've seen, and I've seen FISA intercepts from the NSA and FBI, 
From what I've seen, they have not broken off the record messaging, but even if someone breaks into your computer later, even if you're using Tor and they have recorded this traffic, those keys are actually destroyed after the conversations are over. That forward secrecy property is useful. Something like PGP does not have that. Your private key, once it falls out of your hands, can be used to decrypt your communications. So this okay. brings me to the next point, which is not just compartmentalization, Hello. but a project uh, for every person that is unique Hello. that Hello. you would call yeah. composing. Yeah. That is, you need to compose your cryptographic systems. Hello, so Jake. if you use something like PGP to connect to Rise Up Webmail, Hello. Hello. or Tor to connect to Rise Up Webmail, oh. and then you send a PGP see. encrypted message. Burnt, where are you? you know, I'm going to be next to Burnt, and he well, sees you, me. You don't want to do that because you won't blend in. Well, actually, um, you blend in with all the Tor people, and then you blend in with all the Google people. Hello, Jake. Can we ask you, you a few questions? Yeah, yeah, sorry. I, I have no, the, it's uh, great. It's great that you go here, on. So I can't hear you very well. Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah, I can yeah? hear you now. Yeah. Well, one question for me, like uh, not being an investigative journalist nor a hacker, public space is very important and very dear to me. The more encryption, which you know in certain situations is ultimately necessary, we also need a public domain that remains to be agreeable. And in this conference, yes, we can be seen by camera, we also see each other as bodies. So is there a sort of a basic cryptology that you think is necessary for safeguarding the future of the public domain? I, I mean, I, I'm a little confused by your question. Um, maybe you could clarify it. Are you asking why use all this crypto? What about no, the public no, no. domain? No, 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 I'm not asking that question. It's like uh, in a normal life, we have a, a house with a front door with a key. Some people put steel plates on their doors, you know, so that they sort of start leaving behind the steel and wires themselves. So what is the normal front door with a normal key in encryption uh, talk for you? What do you think is the basic stuff for everyone in such a way that a public domain, which needs transparency, which needs debate and not only everyone hiding behind bars, uh, to sustain? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it really depends on every person. There's no one solution. Um, I think, for example, using, uh, using uh, something like Tails when you're doing investigative journalism is actually sort of the minimum standard for doing research on the internet. Um, I think otherwise it's very dangerous, um, especially because it's designed to automatically self-destruct. Um, I think, though, that using physical analogies to these things um, is a little difficult. I'm going to say something that's a little controversial, and I'm very sorry for some of the people in the room that won't like this, but um, the issue of technology and security is one of literacy. Mm -hmm. Using analogies to explain these things is not actually going to help you to stay safe. It may, in some cases, lead to a false sense of security, and I recommend in that case to remove as much technology from your life as you can to reason about it in the way that you feel most comfortable. Um, and I think that that's a much more reasonable way to do it. But the reality is if Richard Feynman talks about this when he talks about magnetics, he says if you talk about it in terms of analogies, you really won't ever understand it. And by the way, no one really understands magnetics anyway. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think that that's an important detail about this kind of technology. So the bare minimum really depends. If you have an iPhone, you carry it around all the time, and you're always going to do that, you should probably install Signal, the encrypted voice over IP application, so that people can opportunistically send uh, encrypted messages and pseudo encrypted text messages to you. But fundamentally, if you have an iPhone and you live in the United Kingdom, well, the government definitely has weaponized toolkits to break into your telephone. And what you need to do is probably live in a free society, which currently you don't live in a free society, especially if you consider the re recent ruling where they're saying things like tempora are very reasonable. So yes, the bare standard is a civil society and your own individualized risk assessment. Great. Here's the next question for you. Uh, hi, my name is Anna. I am coming more from academia science background. Um, as we speak now, over a million children in the UK are being fingerprinted for their library books access. Um, this is how we bring up children these days. They're used to being tracked. Before they can even become hackers or whistleblowers, we have data on them. Uh, the FBI has just gained access to a machine which can uh, read your DNA in 90 seconds. Uh, my question is, are we, first of all, um, are we now uh, having a generation of 
new citizens who feel this is all okay because that's how we train them to think uh, and are we moving into an era where it's impossible to be anonymous because of all this uh, bio tracking well, well that's a really easy one yes and no There are plenty of people in our, I would say, my generation, Generation Y, I say, why not? But if you, if you uh, look at the people, how they are, in some cases, um, unfortunately captured by this kind of surveillance system, that is, it's a reality. There is a normalization that takes place. I mean, I'm 31 years old, and people that I meet are 20, they grew up uh, basically in a post-9-11 world. They only know the security state as the state of normal. Uh, and that is a really serious problem. But I think it is important to say two things. The first thing is that it is not impossible to resist. And secondly, it is absolutely a moral duty to resist. And it is a necessity to do that. The fact of the matter is the UK is a surveillance state. It, it simply is. 1984 feels quaint by comparison to things like tempora. Um, for example, when Winston would search through the archives to find certain things, that was not a very efficient search by comparison to X Keyscore and Tempora's interfaces. Um, so there is a generation of people that are dealing with this. But I say that there is a kind of resistance that's possible. First of all, make them work for it by using strong crypto and anonymity systems. And second of all, push back at every opportunity that you possibly can. For example, people that advocate for the lifting of your biometrics don't forget to get theirs and to publish them. They can't computer club. For example, do exactly this. And for the member of government that asked for everyone's fingerprints, they public his thumb. Do the same. Take the wigs off of the scalps of the British judiciary that ref refuses to respect your human rights. I think, thank you very much, Jake Applebaum. <laughs>